being here. Uh, we have a short introduction uh, before starting the actual uh, meeting. So bear with me for, for the following slide. Uh, the note well, so I think most of you are pretty well aware of that, but this is uh, the RTF follows the IETF intellectual property right disclosure rules. And uh, so by participating in the RTF, you agree to follow the RTF processes and policies that are listed here. And if, uh, we uh, invite you to have a close look at this recommendation and uh, the definitive information uh, provided here. For the audio and video recording, so the IRTF routinely makes recordings of online and in-person meetings, including audio, video, and photographs, and publishes those recordings online. If you participate in person and not choose to wear a red do not photograph linear, then you consent to appear in, those, in such recordings. And if you speak at a microphone, appear on a panel, or carry out an official duty as a member of IRTF leadership, then you consent to appearing in recordings of you at that time. If you participate online and turn on your camera and or your microphone, then you consent to appear in such recordings. For the privacy and code of conduct, uh, as a participant in or attendee to any IRTF activity, you acknowledge that written, audio, video, and photographic records of meetings uh, may be made public. And uh, the information, personal information you provide will be also uh, handled according to the privacy policy that you can find references here in this slide. A short statement on the goals of the IRTF. So the IRTF conducts research. It is not a standards development organization. The Internet Research Task Force focuses on long-term research issues related to the Internet, while the parallel organization, the IETF, focuses on shorter-term issues of engineering and standards making. And while the IRTF can publish informational and experimental documents in the RFC series, its primary goal is to promote the development of research collaboration, teamwork in exploring research issues related to internet protocols, application architecture, and technologies. And you can get more information about the, the goals and missions of the IRTF in the uh, an IRTF primer for IETF participants, RFC. Uh, the online meeting etiquette, so this session is being recorded. Please keep your audio muted and video off when not presenting or speaking. And when speaking, please start by stating your name. A few useful links, you can also find that on the uh, IETF uh, meeting agenda. So the links to the materials, the meeting sessions, and the meeting notes. So for today, we have a very dense agenda. We have two hours meeting, but we have a lot of topics to cover. So uh, our first request will be for presenters, please stick to the time allocated, not more. We would like to have time for question and answers. So bear in mind also when you're presenting to keep time in your presentation to address questions that you will have. Uh, so uh, do not use all your slots just for presenting your slides. So we will start with the, this uh, current introduction and research group status. Then we will have a guest presentation and a number of topics on network digital twin, green networking, artificial intelligence and internet-based networking. I'm not go through the details because we want to save a bit of time here. Um, just a quick status on some activities of the research group. So we have uh, research group documents uh, in the pipe. We have two documents that are with the RFC editor, currently in the edit stage. So the, editor, the RFC editor is uh, looking into those documents and we expect to get some feedback soon on the next steps. We have one active research group document, Digital Twin Network Concept and, Ar and Reference Architecture, and we will have an update on the progress of this draft uh, in this session. And um, we have also um, another document, Network Measurement Intent, one of IBN use cases that has been in a first call for adoption. And uh, we ask for a revision, addressing some uh, comments received to make a second call for adoption. And we will also have updates on this document in this session. Uh, not look for future meeting, but this is a bit business as usual. We will organize uh, some interim meetings uh, or follow-up discussion on the different topics. Uh, we have one in the pipe that we try to organize for some time on the design, deployment, and operation of distributed AI. We have also some presentation today about this topic, but we would like to offer a later platform to address this topic in a dedicated interim or collocate with a research conference. Uh, we have a network digital twin side meeting uh, this evening uh, in the Philadelphia South uh, room. So just side meeting and it's not an, uh, an official meeting, no agenda. Uh, we can also organize follow-up discussion on IBN use cases. So uh, 
also we are open to receive your inputs for, for further meetings. Uh, this will be for interim ones, uh, but uh, the next, let's say, plenary meeting we aim for will be with uh, IATF 115 in London in November. And that's it for the introduction. I uh, invite you to go now to the uh, next step in the agenda. And I invite Felipe to come to the stage to present. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Philip Lopez. I'm a lecturer and researcher at the Federal Institute of Alagoas in Brazil. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Guillermo and Lord for giving me the opportunity for of presenting this work here today. Um, before, before I start, I will try to, let me just to put it in mute mode. Uh, I need to break the protocol a little bit. I don't know if you see that there are no so many Brazilian here today, so uh, I'm not here by any support of the Brazilian government. I'm here just for the support of the Future Way uh, company that provided the order at the Brazilian Congress of the Computing Society. And yeah. Um, and for denunciate or denounce the neglect that's occurring in Brazil right now in science and research and education. So my presence here is not due to the, with the support of the Brazilian government. So, well, starting talking about the paper entitled Using the RFC 7575 and Models at Runtime for Enabling Autonomic Network in SDN, it was an order at the workshop pre-IETF last year. It is part of my PhD thesis uh, that I defended in 2020 uh, by the University, Federal University of Pernambuco, also in Brazil. And I'll just present part of it. If you have, want to see more details, we can discuss, discuss later. This next one. Well, before talking about the paper itself, we need to remember or to introduce you about the concept involved in it. The autonomic, the autonomic network management, as may you see, may you know, we have in traditional management, in traditional network, we have this autonomic loop put above the data plane where we need to define the business goals, we need to define the knowledge generation, we need to define how the policy process will occur, and also the information process. The thing is, how can we translate or to insert all of these components, all of this post processing, the, the business objectives and stuff in the data plane? Uh, this architecture here, it's not new. It's the Foucault architecture based on Strassner. It's from 2006. And it just defines how this autonomic loop can be coupled with the data plane. The next. Well, when we consider the SDN network, the SDN architecture, obviously these business goals, the policies, the knowledge generation, the policy processing, 
it now needs to communicate through the control plane. And for communicating with the control plane, we need to translate these business goals into network rules. Excuse me, can I remove my mask? Yeah. Okay, so uh, besides translating this policy and processing and the business goals, we also need to represent the context from the network, from the control plane uh, to the layer above, to the autonomic loop above. So the question is how to enable autonomic network in SDN, in an SDN architecture. Well, it raises so many challenges as the recent internet draft entitled Research Challenge in Coupling Artificial Intelligence and Network Management of Harriman. And we can see several opportunities as well. The next. Okay. Um, for introducing the RFC 7575, for those who are not aware about it, it just defines some guidelines. And it's like a reference model. If you want to achieve an autonomic management in networks, not in SDN, you can follow these guidelines to uh, achieve design goals to, to try to implement your autonomic man management in your network. So it defines uh, four self restart proprietors like the self-configuration, self-healing, self-protection, and optimizing. Besides, it also defines 11 design goals. So if you want to provide your full cycle of autonomic management, you need to implement or achieve each of these goals following these properties. So OK, we have the concept of autonomic networking. We have the RFC guiding anyone who wants to implement them implement it. And the question again is how to enable autonomic networking in SDN. We have some guidelines, we have the, the concept of autonomic networking, but how to implement it? How we enjoy these two areas, two different areas together. We know that autonomic networking is not a new area. The first research papers comes from the 2000 year. And we know now that the control plane is software. And we also know that um, there are related areas in computing, like software engineering, that can provide some uh, specific concepts about autonomic software. So if you have this autonomic software, I don't know if, okay. So. If you have this autonomic software, you will have the um, concept named from the software engineer, you have the models at runtime concept. The people from other related area provided a concept that may help us to, to think about or to have some, not so new ideas, but uh, related ideas to how to implement our autonomic networking management using the control plane as software. Okay, so this is the, the concept, the black, Cycle here, models at runtime that we are using in our approach, in our proposal to demonstrate how this combination between the RFC 7575 and the autonomic network management concept can be combined together to provide such a sort of approach. Obviously, the IETF's community also made these several contributions uh, into the autonomic field. Next one. So, Continually, uh, continually uh, checking or observing all the related areas like the software engineering community, community. We have class diagrams, we have UML, we have sequence diagrams. If you look for the database area, we have uh, the entity relationship diagram, we have UML. So in machine learning as well, we also have models uh, abstracting the complexity below and providing some high level models for the users and developers to evolve the solutions, to discuss the solutions with, for example, in software engineer, you can discuss your solutions of, with clients, with developers, stakeholders, and so on. In networking, we can have topologies, we have a Yang model, but is it easy to realize the models? Uh, how can we define intents in there using them? how to grant the correctness between these models to check if there is no inconsistency between the, the, logic, the logic of the software that, that you're trying to, to implement. 
and obviously how can we use Young or NetConf to to enable zero or one touch with or without human touch in the, in the from these models. So we now need to introduce the main concept that is in the, in the core of our proposal, that is the models at runtime. It comes from the software engineer community, and it's, it defines that any system, if it's a network or a control plane running some software, it defines that any system has goals, has behavior, and has structure. And if you are going to give some going deep in the, each, of, each of these parts of the system, you need to visualize that it needs to monitor, you need to execute some action, you need to, to analyze each action that you're performing. In, we also need to separate or to organize these systems in three layers. The objective layer, the configuration layer, and the base layer. So we have the concept how to vis visualize any system to provide autonomic behavior, but how can we implement it? In fact, we need to, according to Asman, uh, an author that um, researches about models at runtime, we need to define meta models at first, because it's using the these meta models. If you look for the left picture with some yellow boxes, you need to define these meta models to provide them formalism for your language, for your model language. You need to define how you can associate each concept, for example, objectives and actions and flows. How are they connected to each other? We also need to define a concrete and syntactic syntax to provide to the user or the network operator um, elements so he can model his objectives and model his network, model his network capabilities and so on. Besides that, we also need code templates. We need to have these code templates to make uh, adaptation in the execution of the system. You cannot just provide for the user some interface, some interface and the user will try to program it directly if you are trying to model objectives. You need to provide to him some abstraction. And also we have monitoring techniques and machine learning algorithms uh, combined together to try to achieve the adaptations, to try to, to execute or achieve the modeled objectives as well. So in our proposal, we use the RFC 7575 as a north, and we provided this three-layer architecture, which it is, which is composed of the network model layer at the above. We have the adaptability layer in the middle, and, us, and obviously, we are using the SDN architecture at the infrastructure layer. The network model layer, we have five models. We have the configuration model of the network, we have the capabilities model, and obviously, we have the objectives model, where the user or the network operator can define his objectives in, in a high structure level. Uh, giving some details about each of these layers, the first one, the network model layer, we need to use the previously mentioned meta models. We define these meta models. For example, here we are having at the at the middle the meta model for defining the mo uh, objectives model. So we formalize how you can define the objectives, how you can associate these objectives with actions in your network, how you can associate these actions with flows, and so on. At the right side, you are, we are seeing the meta model for the applications and for the packets and the traffic that you also can model in your high level uh, tool. If you look for your left, you have the concrete syntax at above, and you have the objectives models using the concrete syntax. So you need to understand these two, thing, two, two things. We have two meta models and we have two concrete syntax being used in this slide here. Next one. In the middle layer, we are using uh, a deep reinforcement learning algorithm. So it is using the information of the models from the objective layer as inputs to this DRL algorithm. 
So the parameters, the network parameters, the discount factor that this DRL algorithm is using, and they are being used from the objectives layer. But it also is monitoring the network in the infrastructure layer. Um, it's really important that we see the, that the DRL algorithm and all the code are just generated from the high-level models. You don't program it directly. The, the code of the DRL algorithm are generated from the above layer. Um, so you can look for this layer and see that we have a knowledge base that keeps learning according to the actions uh, executed at the network with the decision that is randomly, randomly decided and executed by the algorithm. And according to the execution of each action, it can uh, verify if is the decisions being uh, more close to the model objectives or if the decisions that are being chosen are making the, the network parameters worse compared to the, uh, to the model, to, be, to the objective to be achieved. Next one. So the discussion to bring to here is that as we have the clear conceptual difference between intent, policies, and service models, as the internet draft, intent-based network, uh, concepts and, and definition, we can discuss if the proposed market approach, if this model at, at runtime approach is a feasible way to implement these abstractions and this concept. Uh, and if could the ARC architecture can have this new abstraction level using these models to um, create the, the modeling and translate these models into network code. And the last thing that I bring here to discuss is that if or how intense uh, will be translate or translated into network code or network rules, uh, how they will be integrated with the monitoring and the adaptation rules and actions. So a mark-based definition, a mark-based approach may help in this case. Okay, concluding, we just saw this proposal for an, uh, enabling autonomic networking management in SDN. We saw how the combination between different, different um, areas of knowledge can be combined to provide some new solution. We also see briefly um, high-level modeling, modeling uh, architecture for implementing this autonomic networking. And we just saw the discussion that may occur so far. Okay. Well, just to acknowledge the uh, supporters for me that I'm being here today, the Future Way that is, uh, provided the travel grant, the Federal Institute of Lagoas that provided my, me the, the agenda to be here, and also the Laboratory of Data Engineering and Analysis where I do my research. Thank you very much. We have time for question or comments. <clears throat> okay, so if there are no questions, thank you again, Felipe. We can. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm sorry, um, we have a lot of telephonica. I, what I was wondering is precisely these smart models, how complex would be to derive them from the uh, fr from the normal specs we have or from the normal goals because you know I, I have no doubt that this once you have this in place it would be useful the problem is how long it would take to to have them in places in place when you when you need to monitor a service define a service or what is your your experience or whether you have uh, any kind of metrics or something like that about the process for okay if I understood you correctly, are you asking about the performance of this model? No, no, I'm, I'm talking about the learning curve, uh, how much oh, okay. for someone, let's say we now go and, and try to define a, a, a service based on a service six that is so in fashion and um, connecting several points and how much would it take to, to, to apply these and, and make an analysis? Because at the end, if you have to derive this from Protocol by protocol, it seems a little bit lengthy. Uh, I think I understand now. Well, we, as we have like a um, 
layer or a meta model that abstracts the comp complexity, we are not um, protocol oriented. We can generate the natural rules for any protocol. So for, ex for example, you can model your objectives model, okay? So after you model it, it can generate code for OpenFlow, it can generate code for P4, it can generate code for any protocol. So it's the, the learning curve, if you mention it, it right? I, the learning curve is just to know how to, to connect the boxes for, for defining what's your objective. For example, um, if but, you want- But you need the meta model in the, to, to start with, right? Yeah, the meta, you don't need to create the meta model. Actually, the network operator doesn't doesn't need to create the meta model. He just used he just needs to use the the model above, the concrete syntax. Mm -hmm. It's like a model language, like a mm -hmm. um, a UML or, or class diagram. But for having this class diagram, do you agree that you have a meta model describing it, right? Okay. So it's a model that has a meta model describing it. So the meta model itself, yes, we need to develop for each case, like the, the objects that you need. But after defining it, the network operator or the network developer, he just, use, he just needs to use the concrete syntax, like model, creating his class diagram if you are a software engineer. Yeah, so, yeah, okay, okay. I, I think I understand. I had to, to, to look in, in a little bit more detail as well. Thank okay. You. Thank you. I, I engage, invite you to maybe continue the discussion offline after the session. We have a really tight agenda. Thank you, Felipe. I think there will be follow-up discussion after the session. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker uh, will be Sheng Su for the concept and reference architecture draft. Uh, hello, chairs and everyone. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, uh, uh, this is Shen Zhou from China Mobile. Today, uh, I will present the draft update of Digital Tree Network concept and reference architecture on behalf of our co-authors. Next slide, please. Uh, the draft was adopted by uh, the research group uh, in March this year and uh, a major change in this version is to add new sections of enabling technologies to build digital network uh, to reply the uh, reviewer's comment, uh, actually, and including uh, data collection services, uh, network modeling, network visualization, and uh, interfaces. Uh, the coming slides will show the uh, brief uh, uh, info uh, on the four enablers, respectively. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, first uh, enabler is data collection and, and management. Uh, regarding data collection, uh, diverse, uh, diversified uh, tools can be used to uh, collect various type of data, uh, including uh, legacy tools of uh, SMP, NetConf, uh, IPFIX, telemetry, INT, et cetera, uh, and also some in, in narrative tools like uh, sketch-based uh, measurement, IFIT, uh, instrument flow information telemetry, IOM, and uh, in-band flow learning, et cetera. Uh, actually, uh, we have submitted a dedicated new draft uh, regarding data collection. I will give uh, uh, instruction uh, later. For data management, uh, data warehouse tech, uh, fast search, batch data handling, conflict avoidance, and uh, unified interface for data exchange should be studied firstly. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, net network modeling uh, is the most important in, in enabler uh, to build digital twin network. This slide shows a brief summary and the comparison, comparison for uh, several major modeling types. The first type is uh, simulation or emulation, such as uh, NS2, S3, OPNet, Mininet, uh, EVE, NG, and uh, GNS, uh, uh, GNS3. The second type is uh, virtual uh, light technologies uh, using uh, NFV uh, containers, uh, etc. Microsoft uh, CrossNet and uh, Arrestus uh, Cloud Vision Portal CVP are, are successful examples here. Uh, you know, the first two types of uh, modeling methods are easy to deploy and suitable for, uh, especially suitable for uh, functional uh, and protocol validation. However, uh, they have limitations of uh, uh, including 
high resource consumption, poor performance analysis ability, and poor scalability. Uh, a, thir a third type is modeling uh, using mathematical abstraction. Uh, here is the three typical uh, methods uh, include uh, formal methods or formal uh, validation or verification uh, theory, uh, theory of uh, bottleneck structure and uh, data-driven uh, AI machine learning algorithms. You know, each type has some uh, example solutions uh, listed in the table you can see. And uh, mathematical models are of low uh, resource cost and fast uh, calculation and uh, uh, suitable for, especially suitable for large scale network. Uh, however, uh, we think that have, those have some limitations uh, on extensibility and uh, uh, lack, uh, lack of uh, ability on functional and protocol evaluation. Specifically, uh, AI machine learning models uh, have low uh, interpretability and also needs a relatively expensive data for training. Uh, since each type of net network modeling has both uh, pros and uh, cons, uh, we believe that multiple methods can be uh, in combination to build a comprehensive uh, digital twin network system. Next slide, please. Among all, all methods, different methods Shane, you, you will have to yeah? speed up and move to the next slide, uh, to the next presentation pretty soon, please. Okay. Uh, okay. Among all methods, digital um, um, network modeling is a whole research direction. Uh, this slide shows a digital twin modeling survey uh, from digital performance modeling uh, perspective. So for more details, you can uh, refer the print uh, of print, print paper. Next slide, please. Okay, for uh, network visualization help, uh, your, uh, visualization help users better understand the internal structure of network and mine the valuable information hidden in the network. This slide lists uh, candidate techniques uh, for network topology visibility, uh, modeling visibility, and interaction, uh, interaction uh, methods respectively. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows the three uh, types of interfaces to build a uh, DTM system based on uh, proposed architecture. Uh, all interfaces should be open and standardized. Spe uh, specifically, uh, no bound interfaces should be extensible, uh, and the uh, candidate options can be restful and uh, rest conf. Uh, internal interfaces should be fast and efficient. Uh, candidate options can be uh, XMPP and uh, HTTP3. Uh, Southbound interfaces should be light weighted. Uh, candidate options can be SMP and NetConf. Next slide, please. Okay, in the future, uh, we will uh, dig deep on a, each enabling te technology and uh, we'll uh, build a digital twin network system on trial network and uh, validate and the gains against uh, specific use cases. Uh, we also work on proposals to enhance the document. Thank you. Okay, Shang, I suggest you go to the next presentation right now and we will address question at the end of the slot, please. Please, please keep it concise in three minutes, the presentation. Okay. Uh, 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 this is, uh, here I will pre present the job update on uh, data collection and requirement, uh, uh, and uh, uh, requirement, uh, the data collection requirements and the technology for digital to network. Next slide, please. Uh, the scope of the draft includes describe uh, describe the requirements and data collection at, uh, for building digital twin network and to provide the data collection method towarding uh, build digital twin uh, data, uh, DTN data repository. Uh, the, object of, uh, the objective of this chapter includes identifying the data collection requirements and uh, principles for DTN uh, and calling for more efficient data collection methods suitable for DTN system and the richer consensus on selecting data collection method for various network data. Next slide, please. Uh, initially, uh, the draft was just a specific data collection method for detail twin uh, network. Now we promote the draft to, to extend the scope and to, ge uh, to general data collection requirement and the methods for digital twin network. It's so in, uh, so in this, this version, we uh, rescope the draft and we add the sections of data collection requirements of for DTN and ref refine text and make some editorial changes. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, this slide shows the content of the current draft. 
next okay uh drop uh drop list uh, uh six data collection requirement so in brief uh, I, uh the first is uh the data collection should be target driven and uh, and uh, on demand the second is to use uh, diverse, diverse tools for uh, various data and uh, especially here we list some new inner two directions of uh, that are worth of uh, study further the third is requirement is light weighted and efficient collection and uh, some detailed uh, requirements list here next slide please uh, the fourth uh, requirement is open and standard uh, in interfaces uh, for data collection and the fifth requirement is uh, is naming for caching and the last requirement is the efficient uh, market uh, destination delivery. Next slide, uh, next slide please. Oh, uh, in, this, uh, in this draft, we provide an efficient, efficient data collection uh, solution for GPOT network. Uh, current uh, collection method mainly uh, collect raw data, raw and raw data from physical network and have pro problems of uh, time cost, insufficient uh, storage resources, and low com computational efficiency, waste of bandwidth resources caused by data transmission. So this to proposed an efficient uh, and lightweight data collection aggregation and uh, a correlation, uh, a correlation uh, method. First, uh, a tree network sends instructions to physical network to collect data on demand. Then physical network uh, completes instructions such as knowledge represent, uh, representation and the next uh, Telemetry uh, streams ele uh, element TSE of physical network complete data aggregation and correlation. Finally, TSE sends the uh, representation data to the tree network. This is a short uh, uh, procedure. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide uh, shows the uh, detailed uh, data collection procedures on the of the method. Uh, you can refer that uh, dropped on for more details. Next slide. Okay, uh, uh, going next, uh, we will uh, further investigate and uh, categorize the, the legacy data collection tools toward the various data for building DTN system. And uh, uh, we will verify data collection method on DTN demo system. And we, will, uh, we are coding for more efficient data collection method uh, suitable for uh, di uh, digital twin network system to enrich the draft. Uh, looking forward to comments, stretch, uh, and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sheng. I mean, due to time limitation, we will take questions offline or in the chat. Uh, thank you for the presentation. These are interesting new drafts that you are presenting, and we welcome uh, any feedback on those two drafts. Thank you, Sheng. Thank you, Chair. Our next speaker uh, will be Jordi. Can you come here? I mean, you don't need it. I can switch the slides for you, or you can do it on, on your phone. You can start. Hi, I'm Jordi Pellissé from uh, UPC Barcelona Tech. And we're well, presenting this draft about uh, a digital twin for network performance. Uh, this joint work with all these people from uh, Huawei and Telephonic Research. Next, please. Uh, next one. All right, have this. So, well, very briefly, that because we already know more or less the concept of a digital twin, it's a virtual replica of a, of a physical system, and it um, recreates with uh, high fidelity the behavior of the, the digital system. No? Like uh, the example that most, most people use are, I don't know, I want to build a plane, but I don't want to build a plane, so I uh, use a model to understand how uh, the wind will affect us some part of the wing. Um, uh, next, please. And in our case, we're proposing uh, a digital twin, but only for network performance. So the input uh, of the digital twin are uh, a complete description of a, of a network, or as, as complete as, as the user wants, and the output are performance metrics. Um, one more into detail, uh, when we refer to different, oh, sorry, thank you. When we have um, oh. um, the input, we're thinking of, mm, uh, when I say a complete description, I mean uh, the topology, routing configuration, if you want some specific pol uh, scheduling policies, if you are using some, uh, if you need a specific traffic matrix, or um, 
uh, you have uh, specific uh, flows or different traffic models. And uh, the output right now, we're targeting uh, three metrics. So that is the delay, jitter, and losses. We think that these are really important because they're the ones that are more widely used in network management. For example, in real-time applications, you're always interested in the, the jitter of a, a voice call. Or uh, in online gaming, people always uh, worry about the, the delay that they have. Uh, next, please. And in the draft, we start uh, talking about the requirements of this digital twin. Uh, next, please. So the first uh, requirement is that it should be fast. Next, please. Uh, because, uh, well, we are also targeting network optimization scenarios. Uh, by network optimization, we are thinking of these algorithms that explore uh, a lot of different configurations until they uh, find an optimal one or uh, a configuration that satisfies a certain objective. And if you want to run these algorithms in more or less real time or short time scales, you need, you need a model that is really fast. Of course, a uh, digital twin has for network performance also has to be fast. I sorry, accurate, uh, because you need a certainty that the the, the performance will be within a predefined error range. It also has to be scalable. Next, please. Uh, well, because usually um, production networks are much larger than any testbed that you can use to um, test how your model works and. Uh, well, exactly because of that. Um, and as I said before, the, it should support a wide range of different uh, network, I, the type of network. I said uh, different routing configurations or routing protocols, scheduling policies, uh, and also different ranges of traffic intensity. And finally, it has to be accessible. Next, please. And by accessible, I mean, uh, on one hand, uh, being able to communicate with existing systems. So it needs a way to plug into an SDM controller or different control and management uh, systems that are present in, in current networks. And it also has to produce metrics that are uh, commonly used in network engineering. No? So I, for example, I said before delay or jitter and not, you know, some models produ produce some outputs that are not easy to understand for network engineers. Next, please. And in the draft, we outline the, the architectural interface of this digital twin. Next, please. And we are following the, the architecture of the, the reference architecture of the uh, digital twin uh, concepts draft. And well, in actually, you can see here, now we have the physical network. Then we also, that is connected to the management and control plane. And, and also the, the mm, digital twin is connected to the uh, management and control plane. We have also aligned the interfaces here. Next, please. And well, the configuration interface and the measurement interface, we have seen previous drafts that talk about how to collect data. We can also leverage uh, widely used ITF protocols like you know, NetConf or NetFlow for measurement. Next, please. And this administrator or this intent-based interface, we, I mean, in our, for our use case, minimally, it should just support uh, running the digital twin, defining some optimization objectives, um, uh, applying some configuration, but of course it can, I mean, it can range from a simple CLI to a, you know, a state-of-the-art uh, graphical user interface or even the, um, uh, this uh, more modern uh, intent-based uh, networking that there are some drafts in the group also. Next, please. But the one that we're more interested in discussing here with the research group is the um, interface of the digital twin because basically it's the one that is not that clear. And from our, from our perspective, this, this uh, should be like a request response interface. And you send as inputs the, well, the inputs I've said like three times before, the topology, the configuration, the traffic demands of your network. And then you get an output, uh, three matrices with the performance metrics, like the delay, jitter, and loss. Next, please. But we think that this, this requires more discussion. For example, maybe you want multi-vendor compatibility. You, know? you want to uh, use a digital twin for some, from a specific vendor for some tasks, or maybe you need uh, then to swap it for some, some another digital twin from another vendor. Um, also, we don't really understand which control plane element should we connect. Should we connect to a, an intent-based interface? Should we connect to... Um, to an SDN controller. And also, 
I, I said that the type of interface should be a request response, but maybe you want the publish subscribe model in which you are continuously evaluating the performance of the network because you want to adjust in real time some performance uh, parameters. Should we include inside the digital twin the validation of the SLA? So just, you know, like a Boolean telling you, okay, the SLA is okay, it's not okay. Or maybe this is usually something done in the management plane. Next, please. And finally, well, I have a quick notes about the implementation. Next, please. Well, we already presented this table um, in the previous meeting, so I'm going to go quickly, very quickly over it because also uh, we more or less saw the same in the previous uh, presentation. No, so the first thing you consider when you want to build a digital room is say, okay, maybe we can do it with simulation, and because network simulators are very accurate. Um, and also they support virtually any feature, and if they don't support, you can implement it. But the key point is that they uh, take a lot of time to run. Uh, for example, we've said that like 10 gigabits links can take like 11 hours to simulate. And we said that we would like a digital thing that is fast to perform network optimization. The next you could think about is our queuing theory models because they are super fast and they can provide reasonable accuracy. But there is consensus on the research uh, community that um, they suffer from accuracy when you have realistic traffic models, like a TCP or, or equivalent. And finally, we had to look at uh, machine learning models. And well, we tested different machine learning models. And our conclusion is that uh, graph neural networks, that are a kind of neural networks that uh, are able to understand graphs, are the ones that offer uh, outstanding accuracy. Uh, basically because, I mean, the input is a graph, so it's they naturally... Uh, Render to, to to this nice performance. Next, please. But why, why I'm taking, talking about implementation in a research group? Well, um, if we are about to work with machine learning, well, it's it's a continuously developing technology. It's uh, really complex, and and there are some limitations that are not are different from what we're used in networking. No, so I don't know. Maybe you have a a switch and you know that it, the the backplane goes at one terabit, and you can do your calculations more or less. But for example, with machine learning, well, everyone knows right? it needs a lot of uh, data to train. Maybe you cannot, uh, you don't have this data. Maybe um, you have some uh, legal limitations on obtaining this data, or it's from a customer and you cannot ask your customer data. And also another interesting point is that the usually machine learning models cannot predict what they have not seen. So if I have a model and uh, I haven't trained it with, uh, samples of a network that is congested, it will never, ever tell me that my network will get congested. And this is not really useful. And in order to understand also the, all these limitations, we implemented a, a performance digital twin prototype that is called Ground Erlang, and it's based on GNNs, and we have open source here. You can get it on, on GitHub, uh, in order that, so that people know more or less the limitations of, can play with it and understand the limitations of this technology. I think that's all. Oh, we have two minutes. Yeah, okay. So if there are comments or questions to Jordi and the co-authors. I mean, I'm sure since the network digital twin topic will be ended also uh, later, next presentation and this evening, there will be a lot of questions for follow-ups, but thanks. Okay, our next speaker will be Dan Yang or Hong Wei. Dan Yang. Online, please. Okay, Dan Yang, you can start your presentation. You have uh, five minutes for twice. So you can, I mean, take 10 okay. minutes to go through the first slide to the to, to presentation. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay, then I will give a present about the two drafts uh, in hand. And the uh, next slide, please. And uh, the first one is uh, about the digital twin network flow simulation. Uh, uh, you know, some important application scenarios of the digital twin network uh, all require the virtual flow in the 
twin network to accurately simulate the real flow in the physical network. Uh, for example, a network new te technology experiment, network configuration, verification, network performance optimization, and so on. Uh, so how to accurately simulate the real flow is a question. Mm. And uh, to solve the problem, we propose uh, uh, we propose the following methods to realize the high fidelity simulation of the physical flow by the twin flow, and uh, it also needs to satisfy the uh, three uh, so following the satisfy the following three characteristics at the same time, uh, which can be concluded as the three consistent. Uh, uh, the uh, forwarding paces are consistent, means that uh, uh, the twin nodes that twin flow passes through at the twin network layer are consistent uh, with the physical nodes that physical flow passes through at the physical network layer. Uh, uh, and uh, the second one is that uh, means the twin flow and the physical flow have the same performances as the network delay packets lose and data. Uh, uh, data characteristics uh, are consistent, means that uh, uh, the data packets of uh, twin flow and physical flow have the same key characteristics. And next slide, please. Uh, so as, uh, uh, as shown in the animation on the right, uh, please uh, click the uh, play the animation. Uh, the most uh, perfect uh, twin flow satisfies that uh, the data forwarding pace, forwarding time, and uh, the flow data are exactly the same with the physical traffic. Uh, please help to play the animation. Thanks. Daniel, I'm sorry, but this is a PDF, and I think the animation is not playable right now. Uh, OK, OK. Uh, however, this uh, is obviously uh, impossible um, because data collection takes time and the package by package is too So how should we implement the simulation of the twin flow? Uh, it needs to, uh, we think that it needs to satisfy the three key technologies. Uh, first is that uh, the physical network element and the twin network element have unique identifiers in the entire network. Uh, second is that uh, the data transmission ne network um, between the physical network and the digital twin network uh, are using the Dynite networking. Uh, sec uh, the third is that only the key information of physical flow is uh, collected. So some payload information doesn't need to be collected. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, so this page gives the advantages of the, the proposed simulated methods. Uh, the first one is that the forwarding pace, forwarding time, and key flow information are consistent between twin flow and physical flow. Uh, and uh, it can meet the needs of various scenarios. Uh, and what's more is easy to implement. Next slide, please. Uh, then is the second draft uh, one-way uh, delay measurement method based on digital twin network. And uh, this one is uh, based on the last one. Uh, so as we know, uh, traditional uh, network delay measurement methods uh, are including active measurement, passive measurement, hybrid measurement, and so on. Uh, but uh, all these uh, measurements are uh, have some disadvantages, such as uh, um, it requires special test packets and time syn synchronization, and uh, cannot test all the all network protocols. Uh, and uh, it needs to change the form format of service packets. Uh, so there will have some problems in actual deployment. And uh, we propose the method to uh, solve this, solve, solve, it, solve this. And uh, it can realize that uh, 
no need to send measurement packets, no need to change the physical network configuration, no need to change the format of service packets, and no require physical network elements to support the time syn synchronization protocol. Oh, so next slide, please. So this page is about uh, the specific solutions. Uh, uh, first, uh, according to the digital team network architecture, build, uh, we, will, uh, uh, we can build a digital team layer, including team network elements are corresponding to physical network elements. Um, then maintain the time synchronization between each team network element in the digital team layer. And uh, it uh, can be two, uh, two cases. Uh, first uh, one is uh, if multi if multiple twin network elements are in the same physical entity, such as the NFA based uh, modeling methods, uh, where multiple twin network elements are deployed in one server and share the same local clock, the twin network elements themselves is uh, time synchronized. Uh, the other one is that uh, if multiple network elements are depend, uh, deployed in different uh, physical entities use PTP or NTP to achieve time synchronization between physical entities uh, to ensure the uh, time synchronization of all twin network elements. And uh, uh, the data transmission from the physical network layer to the digital twin layer. Uh, we we'll use a delayed deterministic network to ensure that the data transmission delay between each physical network elements are the twin network elements uh, is uh, deterministic and uh, uh, are pre-calculable. Pre uh, so when a flow of the physical network is input from the physical network element one, uh, uh, you can see the uh, uh, figure in the right. Uh, uh, when the uh, flow of the network, uh, physical network is input from the physical network element one, passes through the physical network elements two and three, and finally is output from the physical network element four. Uh, and when physical network element one receives the data package, it will normally forward the data to physical network element two and uh, transmit the data to twin network element one at the same time. At this time, the local time of the twin network element one is uh, uh, can be seen as a little t1 and the deterministic network transmission delay is uh, uh, a big t1. Uh, then the arrival time of the traffic information recorded by the twin network element is the, the little t1 minus the big t1. Similarly, the arrival time of the data packet recorded by other twin network elements uh, uh, is uh, little tn minus little tn, uh, little big tn. And next slide, please. Uh, then according to the arrival time of the data package at the twin network elements uh, is one way uh, transmission delay between physical network elements uh, can be calculated. Uh, so for example, uh, if a UDP data package is transmitted from physical element to network element one to physical network element three, uh, the one way transmission delay is as follows. Uh, and uh, under the pre uh, premise of time synchronization between twin network elements, the transmission delay of packets of any protocol type in any two physical network elements is equal to the following formulas. Uh, so as a conclusion, time synchron uh, synchronization between physical network elements is not uh, required during the measurement process. And uh, the accuracy of delay measurement depends on the time synchronization accuracy of the twin network elements and the time synchronization accuracy of the delayed deterministic network. Uh, so if both use the PTP synchronization protocol, uh, the delay measurement accuracy can reach the nanosecond level. So next slide, please. Uh, so for next steps, 
we will strengthen the realization of the of system solutions and verify program performances and uh, we also welcome proposals to enhance the just thanks thank you Daniel. And, and we have uh, people in line alex first please so uh, thank you. I, I have actually a, a fundamental question. Could you explain a little bit the motivation for this? I did not quite get that. Well, one thing basically is, I'm not sure if basically within a digital twin network, you would actually have twins of every flow or of every packet. And so maybe you can explain a little bit that. And the second thing is, why would you not just uh, measure, uh, perform the measurement in the production network as opposed to in the digital twin? Uh, who is concerned with the measurements in the digital twin? Really, actually, you want to have the actual uh, thing there. So maybe you can uh, explain a little bit better why or what is motivating your work. Thanks. Uh, OK, thanks for your question. Uh, and we think that uh, 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 by this way, we can get uh, uh, an accurately uh, flow simulation and uh, the uh, delay can be mirrored, uh, uh, not uh, uh, can be mirrored uh, uh, is, uh, and the physical network is not changed. And uh, it's just uh, uh, take requirements for the twin network uh, and it should not need the physical network to be time synchronized. Okay, so, so maybe just sorry to, to clarify, perhaps what can you do with this that you couldn't do if you were just measuring in the, uh, in the actual network? What's the additional value, I guess, you have by measuring on the digital twin? Uh, maybe just for the sake of time, uh, Nanyang and Alex, please, Address the, the question offline on the mailing list or directly, please, because we have also other people in the queue. So Albert and, uh, and Dean. Yeah. Hi, this is Albert uh, from UPC. So I have a similar question uh, as uh, uh, Alexander, right? So I don't really understand. So if you can measure the real thing, why do you need a digital network? Now, this brings me to two actual questions. The first one is, um, it seems to imply your graphs that you need the same amount of resources for the digital twin than for the physical network. Uh, that's the first question. I, I don't know if that's correct or not. So the digital twin network is actually a network of routers which are pretty much doing the same thing as the physical network. Is this correct? Uh, yeah, yes, the, uh, the main reason is that uh, uh, the physical networks are not affected, and uh, we just uh, uh, take uh, we, we, we just uh, marry in the twin network layer. Okay, understood. And um, my second one is rather a comment, and I would like to see your understanding. I have a feeling that we have like a requirement on digital twins that we never put explicitly. But somehow we understand digital twins as something that will tell me what will happen if I change something on the network, if I have a certain traffic. But it's not, um, it's more about the future and what if scenarios rather than what is happening in the present. Because in the present, I already have my physical network. I don't know your view on that. I didn't put very well this requirement. I don't know how to express it, but uh, I don't know if you have an, an opinion on that. Uh, okay, we can uh, have more uh, discussions uh, offline, and uh, we think uh, uh, it's uh, uh, not. Uh, it can't be simple. Give, give a simple uh, explanation. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay. Thanks a lot, Danyang, for the presentation. I think there are some interesting questions to address uh, to clarify um, some aspect of your, your proposals. And I invite the discussion to continue offline on the mailing list or directly between the, uh, the participants. Thanks again. Uh, so 
In the agenda, we, we were planning to have a quick wrap up on the network digital twin activity uh, proposed in the energy. Um, so the goal here is in fact, um, we have received more proposal and more inputs uh, on this topic in the energy in, uh, in recent time, in the uh, past uh, few months. Uh, so we see that this is a growing topic of interest, not only in energy, but, but also in other communities, other groups. Um, and this is why, in fact, we invite uh, people to attend, uh, if they can, the side meeting that we have this evening, but there will be also follow-up discussion on the mailing list or by, by other means. The goal is, in fact, to just to understand a bit the future direction of these different proposals. Uh, Energy could be a forum for some of the discussion. It's a research group, so we want to focus on these research activities. Uh, we see that there are other uh, proposal that are more towards uh, standardization or engineering or even implementation, etc. So these are very interesting proposals. What we would like to clarify is, in fact, uh, in the scale of IRTF and IETF, what could be the, the landing uh, spots for this activity, uh, depending on the type of activity, and also maybe to share information and coordinate with what's happening a bit uh, in other groups. Uh, and in the research community. So um, this will be uh, some of the points we would like to discuss uh, later on in the side meeting and again, uh, for, for uh, to make it available to anyone also on the mailing list. So this was just uh, to wrap up a bit this, uh, this discussion. Thank you everyone. We are now switching to another topic of the agenda, which is on green networking. We have two presentations, also a new draft have been proposed uh, in different, uh, I mean, for, for IETF, RETF. Uh, and the first presentation will be from Alex. Okay, thank you. So yes, so this presentation uh, is basically on a potential new topic to look at here in the scope of, uh, of NMRG. And this concerns the topic of management for green or also well sustainable networking uh, in general. There are two associated drafts with this. So with challenges and opportunities in green networking. I think this one is specifically um, actually suitable actually for our discussion in NMRG. And there's also a companion draft on green networking metrics, and you see basically yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm presenting on behalf of a number of co-authors. Um, next, please. So the question, why green networking and why management for it? Well, I, I, think, uh, I think everybody is aware that reducing the carbon footprint is one of mankind's grand challenges. Um, and of course, networking applications have been a key enabler in this uh, by reducing travel, by enabling remote work, et cetera. Um, however, the question is this, uh, is this enough? And uh, specifically, uh, the issue is that networks themselves consume a lot of uh, energy and therefore net zero mandates that apply across industries and so forth uh, will apply and actually in fact are already in part being applied to network providers um, as well. So clearly something to think about. Um, there are, well, various uh, contributors to network uh, energy efficiency today and basically uh, efficient usage uh, of efficiency and so forth. There are, of course, general hardware advances, um, benefits from, from Moore's law, deployment factors, do you basically deploy in a, in a colder temperature and so forth, um, advances in, uh, at, the, at the lower layers, antenna technology and so forth. Um, many of those factors are, uh, well, important and they are big factors. However, they are kind of like outside what we in IETF and so forth uh, could control. Um, but what about uh, network and management specific factors and uh, where basically IETF and IRTF could make a contribution? And so this, even if this may be a smaller aspect of the overall equation and anything counts. So this is kind of like the motivation for this. Next, please. So in some observations, um, why uh, I believe or we believe this is specifically also a management topic is uh, for one, basically management in many cases uh, involves questions of optimization already, right? So basically, as you see many research papers on how do you place VMs, how do you place uh, VNFs, uh, how do you plan routes and segments and paths, uh, optimize according to, to various uh, various ways and always busy moderating different types of trade-offs which are involved and well in this uh, of course well energy usage and uh, energy efficiency and so forth is yet another parameter 
um, that can be optimized and that perhaps has not been so much the focus in the past, but uh, really perhaps it should be. And um, also in many cases, management uh, involves control loops. I mean, I think RFC 7575 was mentioned earlier, autonomic, right? So clearly you have the loop there. So you always have some kind of variation of that you observe something um, you analyze it based on this. You make certain decisions, and then you basically act to, to modify it, and then and this and this and, this, and the circle closes. And um, and for those control loops, well, they apply clearly also basically to, to optimizing energy uh, efficiency. And um, of course, short time scales are uh, are required. But one thing in this basically sets up one of the drafts is one thing that is a common denominator in a lot of those things, regardless of what your decisions or what your particular purpose uh, is of the optimization, you do need to have visibility into what it is that you're optimizing. So you do need to have visibility into how energy is being used, how much energy is being used and so forth. And finally, uh, another aspect that uh, we believe actually can be, can be leveraged concerns the fact, um, and this actually makes it also more of a challenge, that uh, communications is, uh, or the in incremental energy use in communications is not, is not linear. So basically, when you think about it, basically when they, to, to transmit the first bit, you need to power up an equipment that basically creates, uh, well, this requires, uh, of course, a lot of uh, energy usage right there. So basically the cost of the first bit is very high versus subsequent ones. Then basically if you utilize it higher, it really doesn't make much of a, uh, of a difference. And this suggests, the uh, question is, of course, how to leverage and exploit that, that there are large potential gains, for instance, by being able to idling resources and taking them offline and so forth when they're not, uh, they not needed and doing this basically in, in, in rapid time scales and so forth. So this is certainly one potential thing to explore to manage towards that. Um, next, please. So basically, in the uh, uh, in the draft, so the the the, the first draft uh, concerns the problem statements or the challenges and opportunity uh, uh, opportunities. We decided to structure these challenges and opportunities basically into four different areas, starting basically with what you can do at the equipment or individual device levels, uh, device level, and then looking at okay, what could you do at the protocol level, at the level of the network as a whole, and then finally of the overall network architecture. Next. Next. Uh, so, um, so at the device and equipment level, this is basically where perhaps more, many of the most obvious uh, things immediately lie. Uh, many of those aspects, of course, again, concern uh, power efficient hardware, eco friendly materials, and so forth, important but outside uh, IETF scope. Um, perhaps more uh, getting closer is basically. Other, for instance, things such as energy saving policies. This is very common in endpoints. You have power saving modes, et cetera. But what about equipment inside the network? Uh, we don't really see much of that here, there. And the question is, what would those types of things uh, look like? Um, and uh, then basically, uh, and of specific interest, also in a prerequisite for a lot of things is, how do you provide visibility into the current energy usage. So basically, how can you even assess that and basically validate with whatever things, whatever uh, aspects you are uh, applying, uh, yeah, whether, yeah, how, how well they actually work. And so basically this requires instrumentation inside the network. This is something that is relatively immediately, I guess, actionable. And it requires also energy metrics of the right uh, types of energy, uh, energy metrics to base these things on. And I see Dane has a question. Do we take questions now? Or I, I think do it at the end. All right. OK, thanks. So then the next aspect concerns the protocol level. And this basically is a question, well, what can be done? Uh, well, there are actually several aspects of this. So one thing one can think about, uh, about well, what would be needed uh, uh, in terms of protocol support to enable certain mechanisms or methods to save energy? So for instance, uh, one of the things I mentioned earlier was, uh, well, what if you could take, for instance, take resources offline when they're not really utilized? Obviously, there are controversies about this that uh, make lead to a longer discussion. But assuming, basically, that you can do that, um, well, today, one of the issues is it's often not practical due to the time scale. So if you take it offline and you want to take it online, 
a lot of time elapses when you find out that actually you, yeah you really would have needed those resources for redundancy or for whatever uh, type of type of reasons and so the question is well what if those time scales could be dramatically shortened and if you had that you would still need to do certain things at the network level right you would need to be able to fastly discover what is the current status you need to you would need to be able to reconverge any state that would have changed at the network level very quickly uh, and so forth and so this is these are things that potentially require uh, you know, thinking about what is required at the at the uh, at the protocol level uh, clearly autonomics have a role to play there intent based networking has a role uh, to play there um, and so forth second aspect concerns also points to think about uh, such relatively, uh, if you think about uh, uh, simple things to, to think about, how can we make, for instance, the, the tables that need to be maintained in the network smaller? If you need, require less hardware, again, less state that you need to synchronize and pass around, uh, presumably you would, be, you would become uh, more energy efficient. So this has a question of this, how do you address your network, how do you deploy, how do you partition the spaces? It's about with energy efficiency usage in mind. And then, uh, well, and then there are many other aspects, such as, for instance, how could you, for instance, uh, apply traffic adaptation that you basically maximize efficiency based on whether, you should, whether it's beneficial to have smooth transition, often good to avoid congestion and collision and support. On the other hand, sometimes, and I think we see this particularly if it's in low power environment, it is actually beneficial to transmit bursty, so basically having some periods of silence and then basically uh, transmitting a diversity thing. And so, so these, all of these things uh, are, are, are worth thinking about. Next one, please. And uh, well, then at the network level, uh, there are uh, th th things to think about uh, basically then, uh, well, if energy is a cost factor or uh, power efficiency is, well, are there, for instance, certain energy related control protocol extensions that would be needed in order to, for instance, make SDN controllers or make distributed control planes and support aware of that and, and, and leverage that. Uh, similarly, topics of energy aware routing, energy uh, aware path configuration, which allow to assess, for instance, the carbon intensity one trip away or another um, uh, off a path and then basically optimize the network to minimize the overall footprint, for instance, to be aware to steer traffic among, if there are different alternatives, steer them uh, along the one which is greener by some definition. Those are basically topics that are worth uh, yeah, doing, yeah, spending research on. Similarly, well, I'm, I was mentioning basically the, uh, the issue, well, what if we could, for instance, idle and take offline and online resources again? So this would be basically is a topic of resource weaning schemes uh, at the network level. Um, and then there are other aspects, right? So for instance, again, well, just like there's placement of virtual machines, the question of how do you place virtual network functions, for instance, again, with the uh, with the power usage efficiency in mind uh, are uh, going to there. And of course, for all of this, you need to have also green abstractions that apply to the network as a whole that also have a holistic picture. Alex, because... can you speed up a bit? Uh, time sure. for a question, thank you. All right, okay. Uh, How much do we have? One minute? Yeah, one minute will be fine. All right, okay, good. So uh, next, please. I'm almost done, I think. So one of the, so basically as the, as the, as the one of the, concrete first steps basically is the companion draft to the challenges opportunity concerning network energy metrics because again it starts with providing uh, visibility and uh, yeah so basically there's this draft which defines basically or basically attempts to set a define of of metrics uh, uh, according to different well associated with different aspects right the um, the, the related to the equipment, but also related to flows, related to paths, and related to the network uh, at large. Again, this is maybe not so much a research topic, so more actionable, so perhaps this one doesn't belong into NMRG, but I just want to put it here. Next one, and I think that's the last one. So yeah, so uh, basically uh, the intent here was to, to, to raise awareness and gain critical mass on this as a topic, and uh, look for collaborators, also encourage more research into that area. And uh, we are also looking for the proper landing spot. It seems that at least for the research opportunities and challenges, NMRG may be the right place. And for this, uh, yeah, we would uh, ask for feedback. So thanks. And uh, Yeah, hi, Dan Bogdanovich. Um, in, there are two problems 
with energy and uh, telecommunication. One is the optics. That's the biggest consumer in the, in, in the networking today. And uh, you cannot turn lasers on and off on demand because they take a few seconds to warm up and start propagating the information throughout the network. This is where majority of your energy consumption is. If you look at any of those nice boxes that the vendors are doing, if it's an optical box, suddenly Boxway stuns and uses kilowatts of power, but all that power goes into the optics. So that's an optical problem and material science problem that I don't think we are the right place to solve. But that, okay. is, the, mm -hmm. that is the major, major problem that has to be solved. And then the other stuff is you're looking for a new semantic to add new semantic to the routing and that you are deciding, okay, here's how we will make new routing decisions. So your energy metrics there are the area which ones are the right ones to use to make the routing decisions and how to incorporate and how create the semantic that will take the energy routing into the account as well. You know, it, it doesn't mean that your shortest path from is the best path from the energy perspective because you have to know how your energy is being routed throughout the system and where is it coming from. So you have to create a much more complex semantic that we don't have the expertise as well. We have to talk to the energy distributors how they are doing that and how they have to route the energy you know, in order to provide the demand for that. So it's a multi-structural problem. We can say that, yeah, we will make, we will, we need the information from you to be able to make our decisions. And again, I don't think we have, we should be finding, is there like an energy distribution organization that is looking into into those problems so yeah so so very briefly uh, regarding those comments so, so first of all clearly there are big i try to indicate is in maybe only a small slice that maybe is within our control of this and clearly uh, yeah power consumption from laser ac is a big big thing but this i i believe actually this should not prevent us from looking at the things that we can control but clearly we need to know which ones we can control and which one not. Regarding the... Uh, but those are the foundations. You, you, if, you, if you don't can control those things, then everything else that you can control is... Okay, never mind. Sorry. No, no, okay, so there's... Okay, maybe this is... So I, I don't believe we should just give up, right? I mean, it sounds a little bit defeat, defeatistic what you're, what, you're, what you're suggesting. If you cannot control the laser, we don't need to look at it. Is this what you're suggesting? No, I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting that, that we are trying to do some decisions without having the inputs from the material science guys, as well as from the energy distributors. Yeah. Because you have to take both of yeah. those into the account to be able to make the, to create the right semantics that will be enabling you to do the proper routing decisions. Right. Yeah, but for, for the second thing, and I know we have limited time, uh, I think, but very briefly, clearly there are many things that you can take into account, but basically making this awareness as, a, as an additional factor to, to trade off is a, is a worthwhile thing to consider, I believe. And clearly, there are many con complexities, and it may not not everything may be actionable that we can define a standard right away. This is precisely why I believe actually this is a this is a good topic for for IRTF because things of this nature may may fall out of that. Yeah. Well, so just, just only quick question, quick answer if possible, otherwise answer offline, please. Okay. Thank you. So uh, thanks for your presentation. I think that the topic is uh, needed, interesting, and relevant. While listening to your presentation, I, I was wondering something, and maybe it's a suggestion for you to move forward, right? Is how much, so if I want to transmit one single packet, I need to first build a set of network, a network equipment, right? I need to actually build the thing, and then I will uh, spend energy in lasers and so on. And I was wondering, what is the amount of energy it takes to build uh, the actual network equipment? And maybe that's something that it's, it's, I know it's out of the mm -hmm. scope of ITF, but I think that it is important to have at least uh, to understand the scale, right? Is, is operation of networks 10% of the whole energy consumption of building a network and operating a network, or is operation just 90% of building the network, right, and, op and operating it? 
um, just just a subject. Okay, I, I agree with your observation. Okay. Yes, and clearly for a holistic thing, that should take that into account. And uh, this is also a research topic, obviously, to how to optimize with that in mind. Benoit Claire, so uh, that's an interesting topic, right? To observe energy, etc. But I want to remind people that we had a working group called Iman, Energy Management in the past. It was about having power states in the network. Exactly for what you were mentioning, it's Sunday, so I want to get a lower power state, or you know, people are on strike or whatever. Mm -hmm. Now we did we put that in place. However, what happened is that whenever we look at the use case for network deployments, then there were no big use cases, you know, from a money point of view. What I mean is that saving a port in a campus network is like nine watts. So if you want to put all this in in, in place with just nine watts. What has come started to be interesting is whenever you could shut down the line cards, then we speak like about mm -hmm. big money. But then you enter in what you mentioned, the, the issue of the SLA. If it takes 30 seconds for a line card to come up, then at that point in time, I had no operator who actually wanted to do this because we are selling expensive stuff for which we're going to say you're going to put them offline for some time and the SLA to come back whenever we mm -hmm. speak about a couple of milliseconds of rerouting. It's not the same scale. So we were stuck at the use case issue. Right. So I think the use case is clearly something to to revisit. Actually, this is also a good segue for you to Charles's presentation, what I believe comes next, who talks about some of those past uh, efforts. But yeah, mm -hmm. uh, Yari Arco. Um, I just want to say that this is a um, very interesting topic, and uh, we should work on that. Um, I mean, it's obviously uh, important for, for for the for the whole society. Um, and we should do our part. I just wanted to draw your attention to another activity that, that is uh, coming up. Uh, the IAB is planning to launch a workshop on sort of environmental impacts of the internet and energy consumption and and so on. It sort of has a you know broader scope perhaps than than what you were talking about. But um, it, it's another venue where some discussions could happen. It was a one-time workshop, of course, so uh, it should not stop sensible uh, research group and working group efforts elsewhere, naturally. But uh, the idea is to have like a, yeah, first of all, like a big picture analysis, like where is the issue and draw in data center people and device people and application people and networking people, not just focus on our little networking protocols. Um, look at metrics, look at uh, needs for new work where they would be more, most beneficial and uh, look for solutions. So that's the, the scope of the workshop. Uh, announcements should come out after the ITF. Thank you. Sorry, uh, Tolles Eckert. Yeah, so I think uh, with, with, with Emen, the, the, the best use case I saw was uh, simply the PoE management, right? So using the uh, network as the infrastructure to um, really manage physically a lot of interesting devices, cameras, um, lightning in, in building and so on, right? So there was, and I think still is, the whole evolving, you know, new in-building network architectures like, you know, cheap switches that do lightning power everything under the ceiling. So, so I think that, you know, still is something to be, you know, taken much more use of slowly evolving, right? So it's kind of these industries that operate in decades cycles. Yeah, uh, thank you. We have to, to stop here and then you can start all of your presentation. Exactly, that was the trick, right? So, all right. Okay, instead of looking forward, there's always a good uh, uh, thing in looking backward and trying to figure out uh, what we have done so far. Um, next slide. So, this is the third draft, and uh, the name is uh, down there. So, right, so the, the goal was kind of trying to. to for ourselves and hopefully in the community can overview of what the IETF has done for energy to uh, enlighten the community, understand and how to apply it best. And of course, kind of the users of whatever uh, we have done in the IETF uh, developers and uh, deployment. Um, and then of course the stuff that uh, Alex has started to uh, present, uh, look for gaps, close them, look for new areas, standards and research. Um, and yeah, trying to also, uh, you know, market the IETF and its work in this area, whether it's for sustainability or what the example I was just giving, right? So all that stuff. Um, for the draft itself, it seems to be most simple as an in, uh, individual submission. Uh, if there's more interest, maybe we get some other form of sponsorship. But uh, I think the, 
when you when you see the broad range of topics being covered, it seems like uh, trying to uh, run for IETF consensus on that content will make it rather less flexible for you know individual chapters with uh, individual authors and uh, good opinions to be uh, brought together. Um, so and uh, we'll we'll get to that uh, you know call for participation later. Right. So, um, so obviously the IETF has never done anything for energy, right? So, um, oh, wait a second. There are these uh, IoT low power networks. Okay. They, so we've done that. And oh, wasn't there one more thing and one more thing? So you, you, you really, when you start looking through all the ITF repositories from one area to the other, it reminded me of Monty Python's Life of Brian. Uh, you have to find that video clip which says, what have the Romans ever done for us? And it's kind of, yeah, pretty much everything, right? So, which obviously for energy isn't true, but uh, it's, it's really when you see the next slides, uh, it's a lot. Right, let's, uh, next slide. Okay. Um, so the scope of the document is not only the things that people said were intentionally for uh, uh, energy and, and, and so on, but what uh, I felt actually relates to energy, right? So a lot of stuff that is incidental. And that's really when you start thinking about what has the IETF and the internet done uh, to impact um, energy consumption on the planet. And that is really pretty much everything that the IETF has done from the beginning because it has led to what we now call digitization of non-digital pre-network workflows, um, which is really very much based on um, you know, the uh, foundations of uh, the packet networking that uh, the internet was uh, the first and biggest one to explore in that respect, right? So from all the applications like mail replaced in postal mails, group communication, then ultimately thousands of applications that were done without digital through HTTP HTML frameworks, right? And so when you, when you look at uh, the success factors, then it's, it's very much related through saving through scale, right? So the um, joule, the energy per bit cost has been going down because we have an architecture with the internet that is built for scale, right? If you would try to replace the internet with many, many parallel networks for different applications that were all smaller scale, you would end up with a lot higher energy utilization, right? Um, so th there are various aspects uh, of the internet architecture, the IETF protocols that have been contributing to this, you know, lowest cost, highest, highest scale. Um, so uh, the datagram with the multiplexing, the end-to-end -end transport. So I'm going through uh, these, you know, architectural foundational parts of the internet architecture, relating them to in, uh, um, the energy consumption. Uh, the convergence of network obviously being the most easy to understand, right? You started with data networks, you had separate voice networks, you had separate video networks. We did diff surf, we did in surf. Um, we did all these things that allowed us to integrate these different networks. So we built a single network, which was faster, ultimately using less energy for the same applications, right? And uh, voice with SIP being one of the first applications that made that uh, uh, move uh, after we had diff surf. Next uh, slide. Just um, if you can, if you can speed up a bit to, to make okay. it in two minutes. Okay. I know this is a bit fast, but it just... Okay, to... sure, yeah. So then uh, we, we can go faster through this. So the, the, the energy saving through sustainability, that's another interesting taxonomy thing that we need to think about because um, there are a, a lot of interesting additional metric aspects we need to look into, right? So there is a difference between good, uh, renewable, and bad energy that we need to take into account, and we also need to uh, compare... Um, then the uh, saving that we're getting to the pre-digital solution, for example, the fact that we've all been aware of that, you know, traveling in airplanes um, on the same amount of energy consumption is worse than doing the same thing on the ground. So that's where applications like tele uh, collaboration, uh, what we've been doing in the ITF ourselves come in and a lot of foundational technologies like RTC web. Next slide. Okay, so then there's the whole, you know, page about exactly that low power um, uh, lossy networks where we have many, many working groups. So that is being covered. I'm not going to go through details to that. Uh, the higher layers of that are called constraint nodes and networks. Also, uh, several working groups with good work on that. Next slide. And then um, there are specific sample technology enablers that uh, even recently we had been trouble and uh, opportunities to leverage, right? So sleepy nodes is, is, is a core technology 
to optimize through specific protocol operation the ability to run on battery or um, energy harvesting. And then my, my personal friend uh, or friend in me in this case, IP Multicast. So those technologies are covered. Um, then uh, the energy production consumption management network, smart grid, and the even more cool use case of the synchrophaser network. So those are the networks built for the power generation and consumption. So uh, that is being covered. Next slide. Um, and then the E-MAN, we mentioned that. And finally, the power awareness in forwarding uh, and routing protocols. That's what uh, Benoit mentioned as where we stopped because we kind of didn't have, you know, I think the tool set to go further. I think we have some of that tool set now, so we can look into it again. Um, SDN or some of the uh, animal work that we've been doing, I think will help a lot for the resilience we need so that we can uh, low power networks better. Um, there's just a little bit of the gaps, just, I mean, this is just trying to capture what we've done, not what hopefully we can do. Um, so next slide, which really brings us to, you know, the call for action in terms of please read it, comment on it, um, and uh, uh, even, even better, so contribute to it. You'll see a lot of uh, chapters where you may be the expert of, of any of them, or you may be missing chapters, so hopefully this can become a community effort. Um, we can get a mailing list if the one that we've just randomly been looking for is not the best one. So there is this old reducing energy consumption with internet protocol exploration called recipe. And so that might be a good uh, mailing list to, to revive after it's been dormant for 10 years, because that was about the time when we stopped doing all this good work uh, and start discussing energy related work again. But of course, NMRG, everything needs to be managed, right? So that's why uh, such a broad topic is, is, I thought, from our perspective, very good to be uh, you know, it's it's the new vertical, you know, for, for all of, uh, of, of of management, right? So we had security, we need to manage it. Now we have energy, we need to manage that. So it's also a, a vertical topic for this group. Thank you. Thank you very much. So question and comment will be um, uh, taken um, offline. Um, next presentation. Uh, good morning. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Yong Gun Hong. I'm working for uh, Beijing University in South Korea. So first, thanks to give a chance to present. Uh, next page, please. Yeah, uh, this is the history. Uh, from, uh, last meeting, we submit the document, but at that time, we don't have a time to present. So this is the first time to present. Okay, next page, please. Yeah, uh, this is the motivation. So uh, as I know that uh, many persons have some interest of the AI and AI uh, technology, but as the uh, experts of the network and telecommunication, it is not easy to find a uh, uh, item for uh, standardization. And there are some change, uh, there are some change in the uh, AI uh, area for uh, uh, especially the uh, deployment AI services. For example, in the uh, before we are focusing on training, running, but nowadays we are uh, focusing on inference prediction. So if we think about the inference, uh, not only high performance server, but also small hardware, microcontroller, low performance CPU, and the AI chipset are uh, the optimal target device. The reason is the cost. So if you utilize the high performance server, okay, it is good, but the cost is very high. So if you think about the cost, we are also think about the low performance the hardware. So if you think about configuring of the system in terms of AI inferences uh, services, then um, you consider uh, various kind of things. For example, 
Uh, if you think about training, then the main the point is to accuracy of the model. But if you think about the inference, uh, you consider which is the target device. For example, it, it can be local device, edge device, and cloud server. And if you find or if you judge the objective the uh, system, then you can co consider and you can uh, adjust the objective, for example, accuracy and latency and network traffic and resource utilization, etc. So uh, in this document, we show some concentration of the system, for example, AI model. Uh, if we think about AI model, there are uh, very kind of uh, AI model, for example, um, heavy and very uh, size of the AI model. It represents the high accuracy of the model, but in some point you can think about the lightweight AI model, the model size is very small, and the inference time is very short. There are pros and cons. And also another consideration is the serving framework. Okay, you can utilize the web framework to provide AI services, but nowadays, for example, TensorFlow serving, TorchServe, that is the targeting framework for inference system. So you can utilize AI pre, uh, web framework or specific serving framework. And the communication method, for example, REST, or you can utilize gRPC and design uh, device capacity. For example, CPU, RAM, or the capacity of network interfaces and the inference data. So the main reason is to, of this uh, document is to accelerate the study AI issue in the NMRG and IRTF. Okay, next page, please. Yes, uh, this is a generic procedure of AI services. So I believe, I know that many persons are very familiar of this uh, generic procedure. The first uh, step is to collection and store data. And the next step is to analyze and pre process of data. And the next, time, the next step is to train AI model. And the, another model is to deploy or inference AI model. And the final uh, step is to monitor and maintain accuracy. So the, by our, the focus point is to red box, the, the deploy AI model and monitor uh, maintain accuracy. So if you think about each step, for example, collection, store data, and analytic pre-process data, the device can be a sensor or DB or AI server. So if we collect the data, the uh, internet or network could be uh, used, but in the train AI model or analytic pre processed data, then there are no connection with the network. It can be done only local server, local area. But if, if we think about deploy or influence AI model and the monitor and maintain accuracy, then I guess that there are something to do for the point of the internet, for the point of network, because uh, we can utilize, we can deploy the system in a uh, distributed approach. Okay, next page, please. Yes, for example, uh, you can uh, uh, set up your the network configuration to provide AI services. The first figure is done, it is only done in the local machine, local server. So the client module for AI service request to the server module for AI services, it can be done in the same machine. But if you uh, divide this action in the, the second figure, uh, you can uh, put the server module AI services in the cloud server, then you can ask the AI service to the server model in the cloud. So in this case, there are some network, there are some communication issue. And the third figure is to uh, AI implement service on each device. Uh, yes, the second figure and sec uh, third figure, there are same and different point. For example, in the second figure, the AI implement service 
on a cloud server that utilize the high performance server in the cloud. But in the third figure, AI implement service on edge device, they utilize a little light or small device in the edge network. So it is the difference. Next page, please. Also, you can utilize at the same time cloud and edge device. So nowadays, we call it the task uploading from the edge and cloud area. Okay, next page, please. Yeah, uh, this is our the main uh, point of this contribution. So until now, if we think about the AI services or AI system, the main objective is the accuracy of the model. But if we think about cost or performance, then not only accuracy of a model, but another point, for example, ratings of services or network therapy and resource utilization are also important points. So to satisfy this objective of AI services, then we must consider point is to AI model. As I said that there are two or three kinds of the model, for example, heavy AI model or lightweight AI model. So if we use heavy AI model, then accuracy is good, but the latency time is not good. There are pros and cons. And if we, the second point is serving framework. As I said, there are two kinds of the serving framework. Then one is the web-based serving framework, and the other is to serving targeted, for example, TensorFlow serving or Torch server. Yeah, I think that a good uh, solution is to using serving targeted serving framework. But if you utilize serving target serving framework, then there are some requirements. For example, high performance CPU or high performance uh, hardware. So also there are pros and cons for regarding serving framework. And the other consideration is communication method. I know that many persons are familiar to REST or gRPC in the same in the AI system. So if you utilize the a little bit of data, then it is better to utilize the gRPC. Yeah. And the other consideration is the machine capacity. For example, CPU, RAM, network interface, Etc. And the final consideration is to influence data. For example, the data is related to real time, or the data is related to batch, or the data is secure, and or the data is non secure. So I think that there are other considerations to deploy AI services, but now we are finding this kind of uh, consideration to implement AI system. Okay, next page, please. Uh, I show you one example of the AI system for object detection services. For, uh, I guess that uh, this can be utilized to autonomous driving. So in the left side, this is the machine requesting AI services. And the right side is the machine performing AI services. Yes, you can utilize the two models in the same server, or you can divide this model in a distributed, so the right module can be located in the server or edge, etc. So you can change this configuration by changing your IP address or port number. Okay, next page, please. So in this case, can you conclude in two minutes, please? Okay, this is the last piece. Yes, uh, this is one of the uh, the experimental results of our object detection service in its services. So as you, you can guess, in the experiment in a cloud server is very good. The average time is to 0 0.5 seconds. But uh, the, uh, yes, this is the uh, latency time. So the, in the, the edge device is not good, and the local device is also good. So uh, this is only one example of the latency, but if you think about uh, accuracy or network uh, resource or uh, network or resource utilization, you can many 
cases to combine the, for example, to consider the which item is uh, important. Okay, next page, please. Yeah, so right now I want to ask some the movement because it is the first and the rough version. So it is the initial version. So I hope in next or well, next next meeting we will bring in as results and share our results and our understanding with yours and promote some the activity in this NMRG. So that's all. Thank you, Youngen. Uh, so we have to, to move on. And so for question and comment, we'll be offline. Great, thank you. Okay. Okay, well, I will give now um, a quick update on uh, the document about the research challenges of um, coupling AI and network management. Um, so as you as you know, it, uh, it was before um, a shared a Google document. So these are already different iteration, but here's a zero version of uh, the uh, uh, of the draft. Oh, next slide, please. So basically what we have done so far, uh, we have of course uh, uh, transformed into the right format, of course, with uh, the help of uh, five key people that you have seen on the previous slide, actually. Uh, because at the beginning, there were a lot of contributors that are listed in the acknowledgement, of course, but we need to to shorten a bit the, the main editor team. Uh, we, uh, of course, we uh, uh, integrate different feedbacks that we already received on the previous version. We change a bit the, the, the title as well, also to include both the, let's say, the, the two ways of AI and M and network management. And also we identify there were some challenges that we have identified to be important where there was no content, and so we, we had the content now. Next slide, please. Uh, so here are the major edits. So basically we had a new constraint uh, regarding how we can, um, let's say, um, identify on what, what characterize a difficult problem network management and what type of constraint and certain constraint is more characteristic was able to have more time efficient solutions that we extended to be more cost effective solution in general, not only time efficient. So all type of actually uh, cost can include also energy, of course. Um, we also extend the description of possible scenarios and uh, yeah, major update regarding challenges was we had these challenges to have the human uh, in the loop uh, when using AI in, in the context of network management, of course. Next slide, please. So here is just uh, a summary of the, uh, of the current uh, document. Uh, of course, you can see there are these, these three main categories of challenge. The first one is the AI techniques for network management. Second one, network data as input for uh, machine learning algorithm. And the uh, last one is acceptability of AI. So the free category with such challenges that we identify. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what are the next steps? So of course, as it was already with uh, different iterations, the document somehow is, is quite mature. Uh, but of course, we also still need your feedback. We have already identified some changes that we have to, to, to be done, in particular regarding distributed AI or collaborative AI and the integration of uh, lightweight AI. Uh, there are some discussion uh, within, let's say, the EDRT about regarding to highlight a bit more the different types of problem regarding the, the type of data in terms of uh, labeled or unlabeled data, knowing that maybe in network management we have more unlabeled data. So that's also some things that we have to keep in mind while uh, addressing, uh, let's say, using AI in our domain. So there's some discussion of adding some legal or regulatory uh, aspect uh, about the use of AI. Uh, of course, again, in the context of network management and networking. And so, no, yes, we are requesting uh, your feedback, uh, maybe no, I'm on the mailing list, but of course, we have some question regarding the value of the document in general for the group, for the community. The format of the document, do you think in terms of uh, presenting the different challenges and what are the important uh, challenges and maybe gaps, uh, is it right or not? Do we have missed something? Also, this is very important for us. You say we missed a very uh, big challenge. And also the granularity, because it's hard to have something uh, uh, kind of exhaustive related the challenges to cover some everything. But of course, we don't want, want to, to dig too much into a technical level. Again, we don't want to have something specific to a use case or something like that should be quite general. And uh, that's it for, for the time. 
Uh, Thomas Graf from Swisscom. So first of all, thank you very much for the document. I think it's very important. And uh, as speaking as a network operator who is collecting a large uh, amount of data from the network and also developing uh, anomaly detection, uh, I'd like to get feedback on section 7.2 and 7.3. I recommend to do references on RFC 9232, which is the network telemetry framework, and especially uh, uh, describe a little bit uh, regarding network data modeling. And for the anomaly detection of AI ML part, I uh, suggest to for reference to the data mesh architecture, which is nowadays currently being used in the industry. Uh, and there, especially on source aligned data, so preserving the, the format from the network and also aggregates. Aggregates helps to reduce the amount of data and uh, for uh, machine learning and yeah. for AI, and maybe also uh, add a section on that, especially when you do real-time processing of data, not all the data is uh, there at the same time. So that imposes also challenges. Okay, okay, yeah. So, nice. so if you can just drop your email with the different reference and so it will be very, Perfect. very nice. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Thank you, that's it. So now we have our uh, last presentation of today, which is on network measurement intent, an IBM use case. And I think the presenter will be Kihan. And hi, cheers. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Ah, thank you very much. Uh, so since the last interim meeting, we have uh, started calling uh, the, the procedure of calling for adoption of the draft. And uh, we have received some uh, valuable suggestions. So next slide, please. Uh, we received about a total of eight members agreed. So many thanks to, to, to you guys. And uh, we also received uh, many valuable questions and suggestions. So due to time limitation, we will not cover all of them in this presentation. We'll just take a few of them for, for example. And if you are interested in the drops, you can read our updated version on uh, data tracker. So the first one, uh, first question is regarding about the uh, sampling rate. So the sampling rate will be uh, uh, constant, or uh, uh, will be uh, will be constant or uh, changeable due to different requirements and algorithms. And the second one is about uh, uh, how to ensure that the measurement resource meet the requirements. So in our uh, IBM and NMI system, so the the uh, the measurement result will be ensured by the closed loop verification. The assessment module will. Uh, determine if the result is acceptable and uh, uh, give the feedback to the um, policy model to modify uh, to, to modify the policies. So next slide, please. And the third question is about the, the difference between static NMI and dynamic NMI. So we have uh, made a clarification on the on different terms. So. A static, a static NMI means uh, the measurement is independent of the network state. Let's say that we want to measure the network delay of the packet, and uh, the, the IBM system will continuously sampling whenever the network behaves. And, uh, but in contrast, the dynamic means the measurement is corresponding to network state. For example, we uh, want to measure the, the network delay of the BD time. The IBM system will determine whenever the system is busy and adaptively change the sampling rate, when it detects the network state seems to, to be busy and uh, it will report, report us differently compared to static NMI. So the last one, last question is about, uh, uh, it, will it be uh, about the, the policy, uh, uh, if it, it will be changeable? Uh, so uh, like the question two, so uh, our in our um, NMI system, the the uh, the policy execution will be um, closed loop, and uh, it will be assessed to tell uh, the uh, uh, policy module to modify the different policies. So next slide, please. Um, we also made some, uh, add some ref relative re references to the draft, and also we have modified the, the figures and the, some uh, 
are improper writing problems. And uh, all of these has been updated in the draft. So next slide, please. So uh, for the next types of the draft, we, uh, we still uh, want to say that uh, these uh, NMI drafts can be seen as uh, one of the IBM use cases. So if you have, uh, uh, we are very welcome that if you have any uh, good ideas uh, uh, on our draft or if, if you have uh, another separate IBM use cases, we, we can, uh, we are, uh, open and uh, help and uh, very welcome to merge them into a, uh, you know, in, into a total, into a, um, into one single IBM use case draft. So uh, we were looking forward to uh, your comments and uh, suggestions and thank you guys. Yeah, that's it. Thanks a lot, Kian, for, uh sticking to the time and also the consideration that it's quite late uh, in your in your area so thanks everyone we are reaching the end of the meeting time today uh, i think we covered a lot of topics i really encourage invite everyone to continue mm -hmm. commenting uh, after the meeting uh, if you meet each other but also using the mailing list or contact the different participants of the research group i think this is also very important to continue the activity in between meetings so thanks a lot, everyone, and enjoy the meeting. And thanks for our remote presenters. Thank Goodbye. You. No, I didn't remember. <laughs> <laughs>